Good day. Welcome to episode 18 of the Aaron Wayne podcast. Here we go, guys. It's about time. First guest of the podcast is my buddy Logan Lemke, and he is an ultra distance runner, uh, fresh to the game, but he just crushed a hundred mile race. Uh, I put a 50K in that I helped him crew for that we talk about in the podcast, talk about what it's like to train for a hundred mile race as well as execute a hundred mile race. We talk about the crew, the support, all the steps and tricks and all the things that he did to get himself ready. So here we go. Keeping it super professional. You can okay. have your drinks up here. I got my drinks up here. Dude, I gotta tell you, I'm super stoked to do this. Mm-hmm. But I'm also like, honestly, like I'm a little nervous about it because I've never done, a, like I've done about 20 of these and I've kind of saved them up. But it's just been me like, right sitting talking to myself (laughs) so but i'm stoked man like i'll do an intro and everything before this so like people know who you are and like what you're up to but um so you just ran 100 miles and we haven't talked about it at all and like you're one of my best best buds and we like haven't talked about it it's been hard not to talk i know (laughs) like texting and stuff Uh i saw some of the pictures of you like after like laying in the back of the car as your girlfriend was like driving you back from Texas, which mm-hmm. is just crazy. Mm-hmm. But like, how do you feel? You said you did a run today. How'd it feel? It felt, usually the first couple miles of running is like the first mile always crappy sucks. anyways. Yeah, the first mile always sucks. Today was like, why don't my legs know what they're supposed to do? <laughs> my hips, like just getting them to move in that form was extremely difficult. Is that any better? Yeah, you Um, Like the hips were really tight and just like... Did you have like joint pain or it was just kind of Not tight? pain. You could just tell it was like a little bit tight. And so like every step was just effort. Like trudge. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Felt better at like maybe a little over a mile in. But I was very much like, I'm ready for this to stop. Yeah. I got to tell you, man. I So I did a 50K and I didn't perform nearly like as well as you did on your... 50k that that I helped crew for and I didn't run for like six months after that like and it completely screwed my head up like so my experience so I'm interested to hear your experience because after I did that 50k and you've like really dedicated yourself to running like you came out of nowhere and like I started training with you and like for the first like three weeks of training together it was like we're sort of at a similar pace and then you just slow and I've talked about it on the podcast before you just like slowly started like going up the hill and then coming back to help me and i'm like helping i'm supposed to be helping you train for the race um but so after i did my 50k it like it screwed my brain up like i was super depressed for an extent like i started smoking cigarettes again Mm -hmm. do you know what i mean like Mm -hmm. it just like messed me up um and i didn't run for like six months and when i got back out there it was like it felt like a chore so like how does it feel so you did a hundred miles is like you were probably in a category of maybe in the whole world, like maybe 50,000 people, maybe 250,000 people, something like that. Like right. having run and you did it in under 24 hours, mm-hmm. which is like even more impressive. Um, and so like, I don't even have a question. I'm just talking like, that's just insane. Like, so how do you feel now that you did it? And like, w- like, what does the race mean to you? Cause we can talk, like, we'll get into like how the actual race went, but like now that it's done, I want to know like, what's your head at? Um, something more. You want to do How do I get myself into See, something is, I was curious more. about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But there is some, like, concern with, like, some of the issues I had in the race. Or, like, am I going to... How do I get myself to where I don't run into those issues? Yeah. But at, like, mile... I felt so good at mile, like, 65 and 70. Really? That I was, like... I'm doing longer races for sure. Okay, so so having done the race, you got to a space like three quarters of the way through where you're like, this is an experience I've never had. Right. And I want more of this. Absolutely. Which sounds crazy. And when Because like, like having seen the picture of you in the back of the van. Right, like, <laughs> right. But when you're in like that amount of people that were racing mm-hmm. and them starting people in waves... Okay. You yeah, because COVID, so you had like, okay, yeah. You were constantly, like, running with people. Okay. And there was a couple of spots where it was, like, an out and back. Mm-hmm. So you were passing people. So you really had no idea 
whereabouts you were in the race. Right, 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 right. Okay. But you're constantly passing people, and everyone was very, like, encouraging. Right? Like, mm-hmm. oh, you're looking really good, blah, yeah, blah, yeah, blah, blah. Yeah. And so the whole time, it was just, like, a huge upper. Yeah. That's the cool thing about, like, the running community generally is, like, even you go to a 5K – and, like, you know, somebody will finish the race in, like, 16 minutes or whatever. But they'll, like, cheer people on right. that are, like, jogging their way through mm-hmm. it. And I imagine at a 100-miler. And just, like, in the ultra community generally. Like, having been to your race, having gone to my race and been to, like... It's just, like, the ultra community is, like, super supportive. Absolutely. They want you to do well. The It being a loop, too. Right? Mm-hmm. So, after so the first 20 people. miles, you knew mm-hmm. the course... And then you were keep coming back to like the start finish line. And I don't know if this is like unique to the Rocky Raccoon race, but right after the start finish line, mm-hmm. it's like a shoot of all of the crews mm-hmm. with pop ups and stuff. So you oh, go in the cool, middle cool, of cool. everybody for yeah, like yeah. a couple hundred yards. Oh, cool. So every time and you they went got, back like, through, so, like, they got everything thing. going. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, it was it was really, really awesome from that aspect. But at the same time, you kind of knew as you were getting like through the end of the shoot, mm-hmm. you were like, "Oh man, I got another." Now I'm lonely. Twenty miles yeah. until I get back <laughs> yeah. here. Yeah, that was that was one of the funnier um, experiences. And yeah. to kind of like relate to what you were saying about like being depressed yeah. after yeah, the fifty yeah. k, I think I lucked out by meeting Rachel in that race yeah, yeah, and yeah. having somebody. Which was your last new, race. Your last right. big race was your 50K. Yeah. Having somebody new to run with afterwards. Mm-hmm. Because I remember that whole first month of running after the 50K was terrible. Really? And I felt terrible, right? I felt Yeah, we, and no we haven't even talked about, like, because that was, like, the last time. We, I think that might have been the last time we hung out for a while. Like, like for a long chunk right? of time. Do you know what I mean? Because, like, you got Halloween party. super serious into training mm-hmm. and stuff, so... So that helped you, like, kind of recalibrate after doing Absolutely. the race. Absolutely. Yeah. And then having... Having Rachel trying to get to like her peaking before her race in December, mm-hmm. so she was like really at a high mileage rate too. So that like mm-hmm. forced me, at least on our long runs, that mm-hmm. I was really had to like pick it up. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then my dad kept saying that you know you weren't going to see the benefits of these longer runs for like three weeks after, and then literally we made it to like a month after that fifty k, and I started feeling so good. Fit, and, and we were running runs. And your dad's that, an experienced runner. He does like right. he does like spark. Did a lot of stuff. marathon stuff. He was a college cross country runner, mm-hmm. and then did all the marathons. And now he's really into all the Spartan races. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, once I started like feeling the benefits and like feeling strong, that mm-hmm. was like a good feeling because yeah, then my yeah. fitness was at a level that like didn't matter how far we were going. Right, mm-hmm. I felt good. You felt like you could the go entire forever. run. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And so you don't feel like that right now. <laughs> I do not. I, I feel the absolute opposite of that right now. Yeah. Absolute opposite for sure. Yeah. Right. The, the last, I felt really good right after Rachel did her 100 kilometer race. I mean. So it's like 66 miles? 60, something well, like it's that. supposed to be 62. Okay. But this race, the Hellgate 100K, the race director, David Horton, is known for what they call 40 miles okay so four miles to the next aid station yeah it's really like six and a half miles to the next and that's another thing that you find in the ultra community like there's that documentary in the barkley marathons have you seen that exactly on netflix it's like we say it's 100 miles but it's actually like one and a quarter you know what i mean so it's like it's kind of cheeky Mm -hmm. right and he probably i don't know this race director or that race but like the Hellgate, and then if it's 62 miles, I would try to bump it up to like 66.6 right. miles. You know what and I mean? And that's what it was, 66.6. Oh, okay, cool. yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so you know, you watch someone, when you're dating someone, you watch them go through a race like that, and she led for like the first 50-something miles of that race. Because she's super accomplished. Like, she's doing her own thing. Like, she's right. out there crushing miles. Right. Yeah. So to like see her go through that, that following day, I went out and ran like my first – five hour run that i had in my training block mm-hmm. and i went out to the new river trail which is completely flat yeah and that's where my 50k was yeah that, yeah brutal yeah <laughs> i did 16 miles out 16 miles back mm-hmm. and i was like running the whole time mm-hmm. so i made it to i felt phenomenal until like mile 27 and then 27 to 33 was like very rough yeah uh but i could tell like my even my fitness from then which that was the first week of december 
backtrack to when I did that 50K, I was light years ahead of when mm -hmm. we just did that 50K in October. Um, but yeah, I feel like I, I avoided that depression that you were talking about. Because you just kept moving. Right. And I think that that was where I had the hiccup, which was like, it was so devastating to my body. Because I didn't put in training the way that you put in training. Like you... Like, that's one thing, like, you and I have been friends since we went through YTT, which, which was, like, what, like, 2017 or 18, something like 18, that? 18, I think, yeah. And so, you and I got really close during YTT, and then just started hanging out after that. And um, th when you got into running, like, when you when, when we met, like, you were into yoga. And, I mean, you teach yoga now, and, like, but at the time, like, I was super into yoga, you were super into yoga, and it was the sort of thing where it's, like, we're doing two classes a day. We're doing back to back classes. We're like doing wall walks. Like we're talking about you, like obsessed. Right. Uh -huh. And I saw you take that and apply it to your training for running in a way that I never did. Like when I was a runner, I was just like, and even now, like I'm a runner, but like, you know, I'll go do a 5k or like something like that. Or even when you and I were training together, I was putting on heavier miles to try and keep up and like mm -hmm. to be able to help you train. Um, but like the commitment that you put into your training was like genuinely impressive. Cause I've known you, like I said, for like four years, three or four years. And like, I had never seen someone just flip a switch like that. Like you went from like, like hating running. I think I'd even asked you to go like, Hey man, let's go for a jog. And you're like, I don't run. Like that's right. not, that's not what I do. And then you went from that into like over the last seven months to doing a 50k and like you placed in the top 15 for the 50k mm -hmm. something like that like th 12 13 4 somewhere in mm -hmm. there um which is like a funny story for the people listening at the end of, I, I gotta tell this um at the end of the race and you might not I, we talked about this at the end of the race logan comes around the corner and he crushed time, like uh, I super impressive this all the time. you were super it was a super impressive in feet like the way you did it the way the like the the grace and like clarity that you had during the race, like as a crew member, it was super easy because it was just like you knew exactly what you wanted. Your mood was good, like you felt good. And then at the end of the race, you come around the corner and you sprint. I mean, like it's you're running the forty, and the announcer <laughs> says Logan Lemke coming in at thirteenth place, sprinting into the finish of an ultra marathon, <laughs> which I just thought was like, and like me because we were both inexperienced. Like I ran one race, that right. was your first big race. Right, I had no idea. So like that just shows like the um, that just shows how fresh to running you are like at that level like and it's sort of funny mm -hmm. and it'll be a story like if you keep doing these races like mm -hmm. that you can look back on like yeah dude I, I sprinted into my last ultra my first ultra you know what right. I mean but um yeah so like the level of commitment that you put to your training I think because that's something that people in the ultra community talk about they're like what's the next big thing like I I just did this thing um i'm happy with it or i'm not happy with it whatever however that shakes out but it's always like this what's the next thing and like if you don't take that's that was the mistake i made i was just like i'm done running for a long time my knees are blown out my hips hurt i don't want to do this and i just like stepped away from it mm -hmm. um but you just kept moving you kept running so so i think I, as bad as it sounds covid was really the whole reason behind all of this right? i think so too man if yeah. covid hadn't happened and the studio hadn't of more or less shut down yeah we wouldn't even be having this conversation it just would have been more yoga right yeah we didn't we <laughs> didn't have the ability to go do any hot yoga so i kind of was getting like a little i don't want to say depressed but was like looking for something physical people need physical act right like, things to do yeah um and i was at a time where like Work wasn't going as good as it usually does, mm -hmm. so I needed something to like prove myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and that's when I started listening to a book, and in the book he talked about doing a hundred <clears throat> mile race. What was the book? Uh, Can't hurt me by David Goggins. Yeah, classic and instant classic. And I was like reading it, and I was like, you know what? I can do that. And then there's one part in the book where he literally says someone in a hotel lobby was talking to him and said, I'm going to run an ultra someday. And he said, well, when are you going to do it? And he said, well, I got to do all this training. I got to blah, blah, blah. And he's like, until you sign up for one, you can mm -hmm. talk about it all you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's when I literally, it just like clicked in my head. I was like, I'm going to do one within a year. Yeah. And you did, man. And you, so did you sign? So for, you, was your first, like, 
was your first decision point like I'm going to do a hundred mile race and then sign up for it, and then it was like backtracking from there, like okay, now what do I do from that? Like, did you make the? Did you like dive into like here's the registration, here's the date, this is when I'm doing it, and then like planning it out, or did you start running like this is something I want to do, let me find something to do it for? So at first it was kind of like a timeline of when I wanted to do one. Mm-hmm. And I was kind of thinking like within six months, but then I like slept on a little bit. Like, You're an idiot. You need a little bit more time than that. Uh, so I had figured like in the new year, right? Like yeah. right after the new year. Yeah. And so I knew I had January, February as the time I wanted to do it, but I had not signed up for one yet. Okay. And so that's when I reached out and got a running coach because mm-hmm. I also wanted to make sure if it was something this big, the training for it wasn't going to be like, I read some articles and there was no way I was going to figure that out. Yeah, you're not going to figure out. You're not going to figure out training for an, a hundred miler on in eight months through blogs. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. So, found my coach Zach Bitter, who, mm-hmm. if people don't know, is like the world record holder for the fastest hundred mile time. Oh yeah, you were telling um, me this. Yeah, he's a beast. Yeah. So I reached out to him, and he was excited about it. So that like made me more excited. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we kind of like got a six month training block kind of set up, but I still hadn't decided on when to do that race. We mm-hmm. kind of talked about a couple of races and then I read an article and it said that you could do a 50 mile race for your first ultra. Mm-hmm. That wasn't unheard of. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I think I'm going to do a hundred mile race for my first ultra. <laughs> Maybe we should do something as like a stepping stone into that. So yeah. that's when I decided to do the 50K. The 50K. Because yeah, like so. a lot of people work that into their training. It's like, let me get a race into my right. training so I can get the vibe of a race. Which that's exactly what we did is we worked it in there. So I had like a little bit of a peaking um, before that race. Which but... is kind of crazy, not to interrupt, but like it's so, it's so crazy that you perform so well at like because – like the mindset going into that, the way that people program often is like, I'm going to put this into my training and this is just like, I'm just going to run the race. I'm going to feel it. I'm going to see how I feel. But then like you got into the top 15 in your first ultra, which is just crazy that you like had the gumption to do that. Do you know what I mean? Well, instead, instead of just like, let me take it easy. Let me feel my legs. Like, what does it feel like to have 30 miles on my legs? Um, and you just like crushed it. <laughs> when the switch flips yeah for any sort of competitive yeah, yeah, thing yeah. It, it flips yeah right? yeah 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 you can't do anything i can't do anything half-hearted yeah for the most part yeah, yeah, yeah. so especially like you know your dad was there i was there we had the van um and your dad's a really cool guy like i got to know him when you're crewing with somebody like you're just sitting there's like you, you know how long was that race like six five, five, five six hours, hours something like that so like right, yeah that's just like dedicated time where we're seeing you for like 90 second right. clips so right. it's like six hours sitting in the van with your dad like he's a he's a really cool guy and has a really clear head and so like i just tell him i said that i will <laughs> i will tell him so i'm curious about so like let's break into the actual race so like we talked a little bit about your training like how you like because of covid like you needed some space to like use the energy and the athleticism that you have and then you brought up like that competitive switch and i'm curious because like you have a hundred mile race and the way that you described the way that they staggered it and you're looping so like you're seeing a lot of the same faces so you might have a general idea in your head of like i saw this guy he just went ahead of me but now i'm ahead of him so like there's a general idea where you are in the pack but like did that competitive switch click in the 100 mile so they or? also had a 100 kilometer race so, going on yeah. at the same time yeah 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 so um, you could literally if someone did pass you mm-hmm. you're kind of like he's running pretty fast he's got he's not my race he's not my race exactly <laughs> um but yeah so the staggered start they did the race started at six so six to six thirty was like the competitive mm-hmm. wave and then 6.30 to 7, 7 to 7.30, 7.30 to 8. And were you self-selected for those waves or was that just No, they just opened like it up. Okay. They opened up, right, and they, you get an email. They mm-hmm. said they've opened it up. As soon as I opened up the email and go on, the mm-hmm. only wave that's even available is the very last one, 7.30 uh, to 8 o'clock. Okay. So you start any time between 7.30 and 8 o'clock. Okay. Right, and they wouldn't even let two people start together. The first wave, everyone started together, but after mm-hmm. that, you had to wait like five seconds mm-hmm. for a person to get in front of you. Um. So, right, even if we backed up to, like, just getting out to Texas for this race, mm-hmm. 
we were supposed to leave on Wednesday afternoon. Mm-hmm. Work stuff. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We end up not being able to leave till like Thursday afternoon. So we have a 16 hour drive plus <laughs> losing an hour because we're going to Texas. Right. That was an adventure, mm-hmm. right? Probably took us 20 hours total to get there. Uh, and we get there, we set everything up. We very novice, obviously. We decide we should. I mean, should. you guys have experience running race. Has, so has Rachel ever done a 100 miler? No. And so like you guys like sort of had to figure out nutrition for twice right. of what either of you have ever ran And before. she's never crewed either. So oh, she's we always really been, had she's to always figure been out what the player. Going on. Yeah, right. okay. So our plan was we're going to bring her bike. She's going to bike to all the aid stations with a backpack. Oh my god. With stuff in it. <laughs> well, and then you show up and you're the only one with a bike. <laughs> literally the morning of us leaving, she texts me and she's like my gravel bike tires are both flat. I don't have the time to like figure this out. So I'm like, all right, well, I have a couple of bikes at the house, right? Mm-hmm. So I like get all my bikes out of the basement and she gets there and I'm just like, we don't even need a bike. Mm-hmm. Forget about it. We don't need this thing. So we leave the bikes. Mm-hmm. We just go. So with, now we with decide. No, with no plan of like how she's going to get from me. I mean, I guess you would drive. Right. Well, basically we're like, she's driving. Yeah. But we also have the rooftop tent on the car. Mm-hmm. So we knew like the morning of the race, I was going to have to put the rooftop tent right. back down. She yeah. was going to have to drive the car. Um, and then we decided at the last second that we should put drop bags at all the aid stations. Mm-hmm. So we start to go out and lay out these drop bags. And this one guy pulls up next to us and he has got so much stuff. <laughs> He's got like a cart to pull his stuff to the aid stations. Yeah. And so we're chit-chatting with him for a little bit. And, you know, say it's our first 100 miler, all this, and he's in front of us with his wife and his mom. He sets up a chair Mm -hmm. at each aid station, a cooler. (laughs) He puts glow sticks on it so he can find it when we hit, like, nighttime and stuff. Oh, yeah. See, that's smart. And me and Rachel look at each other, and we are just like... We're idiots. We're out of our depth. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the guy says to you, like, that's all you guys brought? You guys absolutely. good? You need to borrow anything? Absolutely. Yeah. So where we keep seeing them as we're, like, going to all the aid stations. Mm-hmm. Then we go back to the start line area. And you're putting, like, a couple Nature Valley bars on the ground. He's got <laughs> he's got two pop-up tents. Yeah. He's got a propane heater in the one. It's all completely enclosed. Yeah. He's got his whole family coming out. they got tables, grills, all this stuff. And we're talking to his wife, and we're like, he had even had a changing station, right? Like the for bathroom camping oh, for thing. Him. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. To, and so I was like, "Do you guys mind if uh, we like set our drop bag near your stuff so I could find it the yeah, next yeah, day?" Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's like, "Yeah," and he's like, "Oh man, if you if you want to use, you can use any of my stuff that you want." Oh, right on, cool guy. And we said to the wife, we "We're like, man, we are so novice at this." Mm-hmm. And she looked at us and she was like, "This is his third time doing this race." He has never finished it. <laughs> he didn't have all this stuff his first time either. Okay, well, that's good. So, yeah. But now I'm like getting nervous. Now that we're talking to people that have done this race multiple times mm-hmm. and they haven't finished it, mm-hmm. now I'm like, oh my God. Well, so, the, so the, the, I mean, just the nature of 100 miles is like a lot of people will start and not finish. But was this course, because it's in Texas, is it mostly flat or like Texas is known for like long, flat for what we are used to? Yeah. But still for the 100 miles, it was over six. 6,000 feet of gain. Yeah. So okay. that's decent. Yeah. But not really for 100 not, miles. Yeah, yeah, where, like You take yeah. like a Western States, which mm-hmm. is like the They're like 30, US yeah, Open of, feet, yeah. of running, yeah. ultra running. That's like, I think it's 24,000 feet of gain. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's crazy. This is yeah. basically nothing that we're doing. Yeah. Um, but we train out here. So like if anybody's like not from Virginia, like the mountains out here, like a workout could be a couple thousand feet. Right. Like my, our, my typical long run, which would be anywhere from like 20 to 27 miles is going to have at least 5,000 feet of gain. Yeah. 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 Uh, so we get everything set up. We go to do the check-in that night and because of COVID the line to, to do your check-in oh, it was yeah. like took forever mm-hmm. like an hour and 40 minutes for mm-hmm. us to get through this check-in we go back i love eating pasta the night before a long run <laughs> and i like it to be like pasta that's like a day old i don't know oh, why i like so pasta trash. that's it's a day you're old white trash that's why <laughs> but i love it right so we like made pasta before we left 
and put it just had it in the cooler and yeah. then we we're just going to reheat it on the camping grill that is the that's the strangest thing i've ever heard is day old pasta oh and i mean i can crush it like an ungodly amount of it that's pretty crazy so we okay. get back to the campsite make this pasta with like our headlamps on it's like nine o'clock and we slept for like maybe three hours the night before yeah well at least rachel did she did most of the driving yeah so we crawl into the tent I fall asleep like instantly. I mm-hmm. thought it was gonna be like a not sleeping night before you're doing something. Yeah. Not the case. You just crashed. out. Okay. Out. It's all wake that up. old pasta. Yeah, that's right. That puts you to sleep. We we're gonna wake up at I think five o'clock or five thirty or something. Like four o'clock rolls around. I had to go to the bathroom, so I got out, went to the bathroom, came back, and was like, "There's no way I was falling back asleep." Mm. You could like hear people like yeah. over where the start was, yeah, and like, yeah, yeah. "There's no way I was falling." It's like asleep. the energy's already back up. Yeah. yeah. So we like get up, we make some breakfast, eat some stuff, and it's like kind of chilly, but like not bad. Mm-hmm. Not what we we're dealing with here before the mm-hmm. race. So you're like outside and you're bebopping around. So we move everything down in the car. I'm laying in the back of the car. She's in the front. And we're kind of just like hanging out. We got the car going, like warming up. And I talked to like my dad. And I wasn't really like feeling nervous, which mm-hmm. I kept like expecting there would be some point where I started getting pretty nervous. Yeah, yeah. But wasn't really feeling any nerves. Then uh, um, we go up to the start line and get ready to get going. And like it just never hit me that 100 miles was happening. Before you started. Yeah, it right? was just like super casual. Yeah, it was super casual. It was like really, camping, really weird. Knew it was gonna yeah. be like a long day, but yeah. like was not worried. That's interesting. That might be a thing about like it's not like a sprint. Like you right. know, if you have any mistakes that happen, like you have time to make up right. for it. You know what I mean? So right, get to the finish line. And I don't remember what it was, but I was like, you have an ankle uh, chip on, mm-hmm. so they basically tell you like, do not get near that start line until you are like ready to start because mm-hmm. it's gonna trigger. I don't remember what. I was about to do, but then, like, realized I didn't, like, have something or something, so we get, like, delayed a couple more minutes. We start. We're going to start running, and when they say you can't start a 100-mile race slow enough, Mm -hmm. that's the truth, right? Like, your adrenaline is going once you go across the line, and you know that you have a 100 miles to go, right? So most people just kill themselves in the first, like, half of that race. Yeah. That's what I did for my 50K. We were running like eight minute miles for the first five miles. So my plan was like an 11 and a half minute pace. Yeah. That is very slow. Yeah. 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 So I'm going and I come upon like the first guy in front of me and I'm like looking for any excuse to slow down. Right. So I like start talking to him, getting Mm -hmm. all chatty with him. We're chit chatting. We're going for like the first maybe four miles. And he's like, I'm taking a walking break. And I'm like i'm not walking loser yeah, so like <laughs> like all right see you later right so i like leave him get up to the first aid station the people at the aid stations are great covid stuff right kind of suck you pull your face mask yeah. up they yeah. all have masks up but they still had a whole bunch of pre-packaged stuff so mm-hmm. like sorry for the environment but the plastic waste during yeah. that race was insane i think that's just nature of covid right now like just thinking about like as a public school teacher the way that they're feeding the kids it's like mm-hmm. everything is packaged and wrapped in styrofoam and so like we're gonna see all this in the oceans 10 years oh, yeah. from now you know what absolutely I mean? but, so get through the first aid station and then there was a guy that i saw starting like five or six minutes before me that was like very similar like build and all this stuff and i was like okay and he also i didn't wear my uh running vest oh i just had a handheld oh and then i had a couple of things in my short pockets Mm -hmm. but i knew like the longest you had in between aid stations was like six miles for the whole race yeah it went four miles five five and then six and then you're back at the start line yeah so you you don't need all that hydration yeah yeah, right like one water bottle was Mm -hmm. was plenty so I come up onto this dude after the first uh, aid station. His name is Brandon. We start, like, chit-chatting, and we're basically moving, like, same speed, mm-hmm. right? And so now it's like, oh, this is perfect. Like, I'm going to run right. with this guy for as long as possible. Yeah. So we go. We make it through the next couple aid stations, hit the start line. So now we're on mile 20. He goes over to his little tent. I get some stuff from Rachel. 
I go over, meet up with him, we keep going. How's your pace at right here, though? Like, it, did you get a chance? Did, were you slowing down? We were hitting, like, lots of what I guess is, like, considered a hill for them out there. Mm-hmm. And he'd be like, let's walk this. And I would be like, whatever, bro. <laughs> like, this doesn't make any sense. Like, I literally told him a couple times, I was like, dude, this right here is what we consider flat. Oh, in yeah. Virginia. This is like, this is a nice, this is, this is like, a place to recover. This is where, yeah, yeah this yeah. is where you're recovering, this is where you're recovering what we're walking up right is. now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so there were like many times where it was good that I was with him because it did slow me down yeah, quite cool. a bit. And so we keep going and I think we get to, we're probably at mile 20 six or something Mm -hmm. and it's a part where people are coming back at you and this guy's coming and he trips and falls and he is literally like no maybe a little bit further apart than we are yeah yeah i try to like slow down but he also like trip fall like tumble yeah trips me so i like fall over no okay and you're 26 miles your legs are tired so you can't like stop yourself quickly so i kind of like fall over but a super easy fall Mm -hmm. get up from that keep going we're coming up to the next aid station, and it's like mile 29. Mm-hmm. And like, I look at Rachel, and I'm starting to, I'm like feeling real down. Yeah. And I look at her, and I'm like, this is a really long race. <laughs> Cause like, so it's in your head, like your body felt fun, like. My body felt, so I kept having like, a, I didn't feel like sick, but there was in the first part of the race where I felt like I like just needed to puke. Yeah, I mean, and there's a lot of people that are going to listen to this that have never done any sort of long distance stuff and like the nutrition of like trying to figure that out because like you're burning glycogen. So you have to be eating a lot of carbohydrates. Right. So like a lot of the stuff is the goos and the powders and stuff like that, which can really kind of wreak havoc on your gut. So just training your gut is as much as the training as your legs and your lungs. Every 45 minutes. Mm hmm. Plus every time I came into an aid station. And what were you eating? Because in your 50k, it was a lot of goose. I did, and then like I did a lot of goose, but a lot of like the energy chews. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think I had like a Cliff Bar. It's got to be stuff that you can almost be like chewing while you're moving. You want to move? Too. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so I tell her I'm like, this race is crazy long. <laughs> Thirty miles in. Thirty miles in. <laughs> Still. <laughs> Three and a half more laps around this. And that's probably the longest you've ever ran. And I think um, Rachel had sent out a text message like around that time. And she's like, every mile from here on out is a personal record for Logan. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and so my left foot was also kind of hurting a little bit. Mm-hmm. So I sh- switched shoes mm-hmm. at that point. We leave that aid station. And I like I like told Brandon, I was like, dude, I, I am not in a good place right now. Mm-hmm. This is sucks. Mm-hmm. Then we get to like mile, basically like 33 plus, And I tell him, I'm like, dude, everything past this is the longest I've ever ran in yeah. one continuous go. And he's like, that's pretty cool. And so we keep going. He's like, cool, whatever, man. Right. Shut up, keep running. He tells me at that point, he goes, look, I'm going to try to stay with you for as long as I can. But I think it's a mistake. For him or for that's you? That's what he said. For him or for, for you? him? Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm like, all right. <laughs> So then so all of a sudden... He, so has he done several ultra? Is it like, is he, he had done this or... a 50K and 100K before this. Okay. Um, and he had a pretty crazy uh, life story, right? Like okay, cool. A lot of people in the ultra community, like addict personality, mm-hmm. all those sort of issues. It so, takes an extreme person to run a Exactly. Miles. So he yeah, had so so a lot pretty lot crazy story on. too. Yeah, yeah. Well, like three miles later, I feel great. We're mm-hmm. like running down this one part of the trail and it's kind of like a little channel Mm -hmm. and i'm like running up the sides and Mm -hmm. stuff like i feel phenomenal Mm -hmm. hit the next aid station get some stuff leave there and then all of a sudden i kind of felt like i was like pulling brandon along Mm -hmm. right like he never really was leading when we were running or Mm -hmm. anything like that and there was a couple times where he was like walking and i was walking and then i was kind of like man i don't really need to be walking Mm -hmm. and so all of a sudden at like mile I think it was maybe like 36 i kind of like peeked back and he was like behind me and mm-hmm. i was just like whatever see ya right yeah. like we were done at that point yeah so i move on from there go through mile 40 right now i'm on another new lap start feeling like shit again mm-hmm. uh 
come up to somebody at like mile 43. And... So you're running alone for those miles, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, now I'm running alone. But I had put a headphone in. Okay. So before that, right, I was running with no music for like the first 30, whatever, 40 miles. Mm -hmm. Put some music in. I see somebody like getting stuff out of a bag and I'm like, hey man, do you have any Tylenol? And he's like, I got Advil. He gives me three Advil. I don't know how I've never taken Advil on a long run. Darn run. But like two miles later... I felt like I hadn't even run a single mile yet. Really? It was like phenomenal. Whoa, like, okay. I'm yeah. like singing as I'm running. I'm like, <laughs> like all of a sudden drumming. I look at my watch and I'm running like, I'm running like eight and a half minute pace. You're and like, I'm like, whoa, you got to slow you down. You can't keep this. Yeah, yeah. Like it was, it was crazy. Yeah. And so then the next time I saw Rachel, I was like, I want a bag of ibuprofen. Mm -hmm. Like give me enough that I can take it like every three hours mm -hmm. for now to yeah. the rest until we're done. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I called my dad, and I'm, like, talking to my dad at, like, mile 43, and he's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, oh, I'm st he's like, are you stopped at an aid station? I'm like, no, I've been running. He's like, you're running right now? So I, like, talked to him for, like, 30 minutes, yeah. and then keep going, and, and things were great. That's crazy that that had that big of an impact. Do you know what I mean? I mean, a cr crazy impact. I guess the amount of, like, pain that you feel in an ultra, like, yeah, there's pounding, but then there's also a lot of inflammation at the joints absolutely so those NSAIDs like just crush the inflammation mm -hmm. so that makes a lot of sense so it's really like my knee that was bothering me the most my right knee well and that's probably a lot of the flat stuff do you know what i mean like because we train out here in the mountains and it's like you're using your quads a lot so you're mm -hmm. using a lot of strength instead mm -hmm. of so they're like the ups and the downs like you're using the strength of your muscles instead of the stability of your joints and your bones you know what right. i mean and so the flatter it is that was my experience was my knees were blown out running the new river trail because it was all like either gravel or asphalt and it was 100 percent flat mm -hmm. so it's like devastating to just like it's like running on a track you know what i mean like there's a reason that track work is track work and trail work is trail work so because you're using your muscles right. differently you know so this race you could have someone pace you once anything over um 50 miles okay but 50 miles wasn't like near the start line right you're technically a half halfway through your third loop at that point right so i just told rachel once i got to 60 then she could run with me so not only did she crew me for the first like 12 hours of the day mm -hmm. but then she also ran with me for the last 40 miles that's pretty bad which is crazy yeah, yeah. <laughs> um so she starts running with me and the first loop, great, moving super, super good. Uh, then we come around, we hit like mile 80, and now it's it's starting to get... No, we had two loops where we had lights on the whole time. Mm -hmm. um, but we like, at mile 80, starting that last loop, we stopped for a little bit and I had to go to the bathroom. So this mm -hmm. is the first time I like sat down. Oh, right? yeah. So I sit down and then yeah, the yeah. porter John. Yeah go to the bathroom when i get up like i was like Whew. yeah that yeah, did not feel good getting yeah, back yeah. up yeah so we go to start the last loop and uh she gives me like a long sleeve t-shirt to throw on throw that on i didn't have like my little windbreaker and we start and she's like should i grab it and i'm like no nah, don't even worry about it wait what time of day is this we've now hit Maybe like to all the people after, listening, my little midnight. chihuahua just wants to say hi. My chihuahua wants to come in and like do the podcast with us, but know, he but does. he can't. He can't. So it's like so a wait, little bit after midnight. At midnight. This point. Okay. Um. So she's gonna run to the car, and grab my windbreaker. Mm -hmm. So she does, throw it on. We start going, and she says to me, "She's like, do you need me? Do you want me to be like mean, or do you want me to be nice?" <laughs> And I was like, I need you to be nice. And so we like walked down this hill and she's like, all right, let's start. We need to start moving a little bit. And mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm trying. I'm trying. Yeah. I'm trying. So now they have like. What, little... a, what a sophisticated question to ask. Right. Like that's natural coaching. Um, does she have coaching experience? Swim coach. Okay. Because that's, that's just like, that's the right question to ask somebody because in different spaces like you because like we're, we've both been like lifelong athletes and like some coaches handle things differently and some coaches are just always nice or always mean 
And so like asking that question, like, and I had told her I was going to need her to like push me. Yeah. Um, cause that's naturally how I am. Mm -hmm. But again, never have I worked myself for never this long. Never been in that right. headspace. Yeah. yeah. Like just be nice to me. Exactly. <laughs> so on the trail, they had like these awesome reflectors that were hanging from some branches. Like they were so bright. She kept calling them lights cause we have obviously have headlamps on. But they were literally just reflectors. But they reflected that light so brightly that they looked like lights in the trees. But she kept saying we would try to like jog from reflector to reflector and then walk. We did that for like four miles. And then my right knee was like, you are not taking another step. Not, you're not jogging another step. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't even like pain, okay, like suck it up and deal with this. It was like if you don't stop, you're, you're gonna, gonna you're, you're gonna pass out oh okay like yeah. it was like that hard of pain where like you're gonna puke you're gonna pass out yeah so i basically told her that i could not we could not run anymore so that's so crazy we are now hiking the last like 17 miles of this race now i get like the first time that like emotions mm -hmm. roll in right because i'm like wow this is where it like gets tough so go through a little emotional time, get to the next aid station. And the people at the aid stations were phenomenal. So this guy's like trying to like joke a little bit. And I like had said my knee was hurt. And he's like, all right, well, let me just, I'm just going to stomp on your other foot and take your pain off your knee. And I was like, well, actually my other foot is what's hurting. <laughs> that too, hurts so, too. Yeah, so, <laughs> so that's not going to work. Uh, so we like leave there. We keep going. And we we're trying to hike like pretty fast, right? Because... I was trying to keep at least like a 15 minute per mile pace, which is, it's like a brisk walk. That's a quick walk. Yeah. yeah. Like if you're on the treadmill, that's like a, like a 4.2 exactly. miles per hour or something exactly. like that. Yeah. So, uh, we keep going. And then all of a sudden I like take a step and just like hiking, my knee was like killing me. Mm -hmm. It's also, we're now, I don't even know what time it is. Probably like three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning. And it's like gotten significantly colder. Plus you're no longer moving right so your you're body has like cooled yeah. down a lot so rachel suggests and you have that, sweat on you so right. it's like all's bad she's like i need to get to the car and get like our jackets and stuff our car is back at the start line so she is going to leave me run ahead run back to the car meet me at the next aid station well she tells me if she doesn't meet me at the next aid station to keep going and she will catch up to me I'm like, why don't you run to the next aid station and ask somebody for a ride? Mm -hmm. And she looks at me like, what the fuck am I talking <laughs> about, right? And I'm like, Rachel, that we're seems all like a doing this 100-mile yeah. race. Like, somebody will give you a ride back to the car. Right. So she leaves me. Like, two minutes later, I walk up upon somebody who's in the race He's all bundled up from head to toe, and I see his shoes. And I'm like, those are the shoes that Brandon was wearing. I get along the side <laughs> of him. I look over, and it's Brandon, yeah. and he looks miserable. So wait, he so he was in a car? No, he was no, he walking. Was, he was walking. So okay. I, at this point, have now lapped him. Okay. So I am 20 miles ahead of him in this race. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. I'm like, hey, buddy, how are you doing? And he's like, I'm, this is terrible. He said, when I get to the next aid station, I'm pulling out. Oh, really? And he's, he looked at me and he said, he goes, I went out way too fast. So he said, so he said initially that I'm going to stick with you, but it might be a mistake. Do and you think that turns was the mistake? It, it turns mistake. out it was a mistake because yeah. he was keeping pace with you. Yeah. And that, okay. And so but that's not on you. I'm not like bringing that up. Right. Like, Hey Logan, feel bad about this. Like he right. made his decision. Do you know what I mean? So I keep going, right. I get a little bit ahead of him. I get to the next aid station and I come up to the people at the aid station. I'm like, hey, did a girl run up here and ask for a ride back to the start line? And they're all looking at me like, dude, it's 3 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. You're delirious. Yeah. Like, you don't even yeah. know what you're talking about. <laughs> There's and nobody like, else out here. They're like, a lot of people have quit at this point. And I'm like, no, she was like a pacer. And they're like, no, no one came here. And so I'm like, she ran she just back ran. to the start line. And so car. that's how many miles probably? It was maybe like another mile back yeah. to the car. Not yeah. too bad. I call her. She's like... She's like, no, I ran back to the to the car. Yeah. And I'm like, all right. And she's like, I'm like, are you getting a ride back here? She's like, I'm trying to. She's like, keep going. And then in your head also, like, you're thinking, like, she could get a ride and be back to me in, like, two minutes. 
but if she runs, it could be 10 to 15 minutes. Right. So even, even in that, like thinking about her, like not making her run extra miles, but then also like you're cold, you're wet, right. you're tired. Right, right, right. Like I want you to get your ass back here exactly. now. Like I want my jacket. Exactly. Yeah. So she's like, keep going. So I'm like, okay, yeah, I'll keep going. I get off the phone with her. I'm like, I'm not leaving this aid station until okay. she gets back here. All of a sudden, because of the rooftop tent on the car, it's super easy to spot that car, right, even in the dark. I see the car pull up, and I'm like, she drove the car back here. Yeah. Because now, when the race is done, now she has to get back to this aid station to get the car. Yeah, just chaos. Exactly. Just like all sorts. Of, but she's tired, too. Yeah, but she comes out, dude. She had my Patagonia jacket, mm -hmm. a pair of leggings, um, a hat. I didn't even consider a hat. Didn't even and a pair of, of gloves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So phenomenal clutch yeah phenomenal right choice i sit down i start taking my shoes off and she goes why are you taking your shoes off and i look at her and i go you did just bring me pants right <laughs> and she's like okay <laughs> and so we get the shoes off i like pull my, the leggings up she like reties my shoes back on bundles me up in a jacket oh here's the big thing luke our buddy luke for people who don't know him i got trekking poles from him right before we left oh luke we climb with yeah oh, okay and as i was getting them from him i was like look i probably won't need these yeah but if i do need them mm -hmm. i want to have them mm -hmm. so that was the big thing she was going back for was the trekking, trekking poles. poles we and get these keep trekking you poles you set like up. Have, don't have to use your core as much like everything. get these yeah. trekking poles set up bundle me in this jacket hat on headphones in she tells me we have like three and a half hours to beat the 24 hour uh timeline Right, which so is, that's not a cutoff, though. It's not a cutoff, but that in the 100-mile race is like a big... That's a benchmark. Benchmark. Yeah, that's exactly. like a thing like if you do a 100-miler, like you want it under 24. So I wanted to do it in 20 hours, right? But obviously at this point, we weren't doing it at that point. Mm -hmm. So we had like three and a half hours to do the last 11 miles. She sets me up. I got one earbud in. We just start going and do the trekking poles are phenomenal mm -hmm. right because exactly like you're saying you're pulling yourself you can lean into them a little bit mm -hmm. like it was great and you're using a different muscle like you haven't been using those muscles in the same way so like all of your muscles that are super fatigued now you can like use auxiliary muscles exactly do you know what i mean exactly so uh we get to the the final aid station and we had decided like as we were coming into it like I was going to just like keep going. Mm -hmm. She was going to go to the bathroom, grab something to eat, and then she was going to catch back catch up, up to me. Yeah. So I just keep going. She gets back up to me. We keep going. Now the sun's coming up, which that like in itself, like running from like sun up through sundown and back to sun up is like a crazy experience as well. We get to about a mile and a half left, and it's like pretty evident. Like I'm, I'm going to got plenty of time, right? And so then I get like super emotional again. Mm -hmm. And now anytime we started going downhill, the downhills like really hurt. On your knees. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we make it to the finish line, cross the finish line, right? Hug, everybody's super happy. Uh, go over to where we have all of our stuff. And she like sits me down in a chair and then like leaves me there and she has to like go get the car. So she goes and gets the car, comes back, and now getting me out of the chair is, like, mm -hmm. more or less impossible. Mm -hmm. I get out of the chair. I'm at this point, I'm, like, I'm not showering. After this is done, I'm just crawling in the back of the car and going to sleep. Yeah. She's like, no, you have to shower. You're yeah. disgusting. <laughs> so You just ran for 23 right. hours. Yeah. We drive back over to the showers, and uh, she gets me out of the car, and, like, I cannot walk. Like, my left ankle is super swollen. Cool. I'm, like, hobbling. She walks me into the women's shower and just like takes just my clothes hoses off. Me you and, down. Like, yeah, like hoses me <laughs> off in the women's shower. I come out, she gets ev just pulls everything out of the car, grabs the mattresses that are in the top tent, puts them in the back, and I just like crawled in the back and like tried to sleep. That's, and that's what I think I the picture you saw yeah. where I looked like. She miserable. just she sent that to the group chat and I was like, Yeah, that looks that looks about right. And like you were you weren't sleeping, you just like had this like strange grimace right. on your face and like your shoulders were all everything hurt up. dude yeah. everything hurt so bad at that yeah. point so i'm curious like so you said uh, like there's a couple things in that story that popped out to me so like you said at like mile 
when you first started telling the story, you said at like mile 70 or so, you felt great. And like, that's what brought you to the idea. Like, I want to keep doing this and I want to do something bigger. Right. But then also you said like when it started getting cold and you had to, like you had to hike, you know, your way out. You also said there was some emotional stuff. And then at the end, like you had that emotional stuff. So I'm curious, like, so, you know, you go up to that aid station and you're kind of blasted and you've been walking and they're trying to like cheer you up. Like, Hey, let me stomp on your foot. So like, what was that experience? So like, what were you thinking? Like, I can't do this. Never in my mind did that cross my mind that I couldn't do this. I knew it was, it was going to happen. Yeah. Um, it was just like, it was so cold. Right. So then once. Like when I was waiting for her at that aid station, you're cold and stuff like that. And you had it in your head, right? That she was like coming back. So there's no more like multiple goals or tasks in Mm -hmm. your head. It's like Mm -hmm. whatever that last thing was you're thinking about Mm -hmm. until that is checked off, Mm -hmm. you can't move on to the next one. Yeah. So like I was just like standing there, right? Like been awake forever super dazed Mm -hmm. and until she came back and was with me there's no way i could have yeah like kept going yeah yeah yeah. um so we're sort of just like stuck you know what i mean yeah yeah and like and then in pain and i was confident the entire time i was absolutely going to finish it Mm -hmm. but yeah there was i just couldn't take another step just like the, the the way that i can understand this story the best is through my experience and relating it to yours because in my head, when I did a 50K, which is like a third of what your race was, throughout almost past mile 17, I was like, I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit. I'm gonna, the next aid station I get to, I'm going to quit. And then, like, I just didn't have, like, the brass to do it. Right. And so, like, I didn't, like, it wasn't, it wasn't that I didn't quit out of, I, I didn't quit my race because I didn't have, like, the guts to actually quit it. Do you know what I mean? Right. And I'm grateful that, like, I didn't have that. You know what I mean? But I'm curious. I, th- I think that almost for for someone like you, not to say it was easier, but, like, that's the easiest way for me to think about it. It's, like, you know you're going to finish it. And so, like, there's never a question about it. So, it, right. in a sense, it's almost easier to say, like, I know I'm going to do this versus having to consistently like no you have to do this no you have to do this you know what i mean well what is nice what i give a lot of credit to is like the way i was raised with my dad Mm -hmm. and working for my dad forever Mm -hmm. there would be times where we were working where we worked for 20 30 hours straight and as much as i wanted to quit right that was like when i was first out of high school when you work for your dad, you can want to quit all you want, mm-hmm. but you can't. You're not quitting. Right. So yeah. you work until the job is done. Right. So I feel like give a lot of credit to that, right, where I like knew the job was finishing that race, and I was not going to it stop sort of until I walked across that, that finish line. Yeah. The fact that you got into running, like I know I said it earlier, but it just – it really came out of nowhere. It came – it's, it came so thoroughly out of nowhere because you had said, like, I don't like running. Like, mm-hmm. Jeremy, we've tried to get him, who's another friend of ours, tried to get him going running, and it, it was it's like the same dialogue. Like, you know, I'll hike with you. Like, we'd, we had been on many hikes before, but, like, running was never on the table, you know? Right. And then you just went zero to 60. And now I, like, can't even, like... To not do it would be weird. So what is the, so yeah, so that's what I'm thinking about now because you ran, you just like did like two miles today and you were like, that was hell. So what is your, so the reason after the 50K that you didn't end up feeling low was because like, let's just get back into the training. Right. But right now you're not training, right? You're like getting back into that. So what was the, and your race was like early January? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So end of January. Mm Mm-hmm. First weekend of February. First weekend of February. Okay. So, I mean, you haven't been running for weeks. So what's the process like a week after? I mean, for days, you're probably just sitting on the Laying couch. Laying on the couch. Yeah. yeah. Eating burritos and watching Netflix. Right. Could barely walk. Yeah. I was on crutches for like the first week. You legit had crutches? Could not bend my, my left ankle was so swollen that I, I could not lift my toes up. I got x-rays on my foot. Oh, you did? Yeah. They okay. thought I had stress fractures on yeah. my foot. And you didn't. Yeah. That's interesting. There's a ultra runner named Cam Haynes. Have you ever heard of mm-hmm. him? Apparently, he's had stress fractures and just like keeps running yeah. on them, which is just, I don't know if that's, I don't advise to do that. 
But I don't advise that either. I don't. <laughs> That's also like the people who have toenails falling off and like all that. I have a friend who I I, I knew a guy who um, from climbing he lost some toenails. Yeah. And that's just a thing people do. They mm-hmm. lose parts of their body to their to their practice. So the after race, yeah. Once we like Rachel slept for a little bit, we packed everything up. We go to get all of our coolers and stuff from where we were camping. Uh, and I have like a really nice Yeti backpack cooler. Mm-hmm. Those are not animal proof. Just FYI. <laughs> and that the was, squirrels so- in Texas are. huge. Huge. Oh no, dude! I've seen them—the largest squirrels I've ever seen in my life. I've seen them. So when Katie, got, when la- last time I was in Texas, um, Katie had her appendix taken out. I think I might have uh-huh. told you this story uh-huh. before, but I'll tell it here. So we go out, have tacos in El Paso, and then I drive the van out to this like super remote spot because it's known for having wild sheep or ram, some sort of critter, like just a wild animal. And we drive out there, and as we're driving out there, Katie's like, I'm not feeling well. I'm like, okay, cool, lay in the back. Like, it's a camper van. Like, you can just lay in the back. And she, like, starts Googling her symptoms, and she's like, I think I have appendicitis. And I was like, we'll figure it out later. (laughs) And so we get to the spot, and then I start Googling stuff, and I'm like, you might have appendicitis, but now we're, like, two hours into the desert. And so we're looking up at the stars and, like, have this cool experience for just a moment, but she's, like, in pain. And I'm like, all right, well, let's go to sleep. It could just be, like an upset stomach you're not gonna die but we'll check on it in the morning and see how you feel she wakes up in the middle of the night and she's like we gotta go to the hospital i'm like i think we should go to the hospital so we go and i'm driving to your squirrel story i'm driving like in my underwear like four o'clock in the morning in the front of this van katie's in the back like moaning like in pain and like i feel bad because like i probably maybe i should have taken her the night before definitely. you know what i mean definitely uh so like but it you know you can think back on things and realize you messed up but so i'm driving and i see these i see these rabbits and i think i'm hallucinating at first because it's like four in the morning i mean it is nowhere nowhere like we had to drive an hour and a half to the nearest hospital and when we got there it was a super janky hospital so they had to take her to odessa which was like still sort of a janky hospital but like the nice janky hospital. And so I'm seeing these rabbits that are every bit the size of like Jack rabbits. It's like, a, they're like the size of a watermelon yeah. and their ears are as long as my forearm. Yeah. And I'm like yeah, driving bro. and I'm like, what was they that? They look like dogs. Yeah. They look yeah. like little dogs. Exactly. Yeah. So, Absolutely. So yeah. Texas so, has some wild critters. Yeah. We get back to the campsite and there's a squirrel sitting on top of the cooler and like huge. And I'm like, they're so used to people, right, that they're like mm-hmm. you get within like five feet of them before they leave. And they learn coolers. Animals learn coolers. They know what's oh, in yeah. there. Yeah. So he leaves. We grab the cooler. He chewed a hole in through Yeti. the zipper part of the Yeti like that big. Bowling ball size. Did he get any food? The only thing that was in there that was edible was one uncrustable. See, that's the thing. Like, So he might have sniffed that out, but also like, if you go to Yosemite... They say don't leave coolers in your car because the bears have learned how to open your car. Yeah. So like you have to keep your like animals learn what coolers are. And so was that was great. Like use the backpack cooler twice and yeah. called the Eddie and they were like, sorry, soft coolers don't uh, aren't animal proof. So <laughs> that's tough on shit. that's on you. <laughs> yeah. It's like what? Are you kidding me? Uh, so we pack everything in the car, hit the road. It's like Sunday afternoon. Rachel had to be back to work on Tuesday morning. What was your work like? Did you take time? Yeah, then yeah. my work is very lenient, right? Yeah. They don't really care. Yeah. Um, and so we get back in the car, and at this point, there's obviously no way I am driving at all. Mm-hmm. So I just lay in the back of the car. Rachel drives for like four or five hours. She's the low-key superstar of this story. You know what I mean? Like, you went out and you kicked ass and you did your 100-miler, but could you imagine doing that solo? Oh, dude, we had already decided even just with one other person, mm-hmm. never again can yeah. you do that. You yeah. at least have to have two people. Yeah. Like, it just doesn't make any sense to do it with just one other person. Yeah. But so we go like four or five hours, get back into Louisiana, and she's thinking about like just driving straight through. And I was like, we're not doing this. So I like got us a hotel room, a Super 8 hotel. In we Louisiana. pull up to it. Yeah, we pull up to it. <laughs> And she's like, this is a ghetto hotel. Yeah. And all I'm thinking is like, honey, if you saw some of the hotels my dad made us stay in when yeah. we were working, yeah. this is like luxury. Yeah, we're living, living yeah, fat. Exactly. We might get bed bugs, but... Right, right. <laughs> we'll be all right. We, oh, 
we're about five minutes away from the hotel mm-hmm. and I say to her, I'm like, hey, when you go in to check us in, can you ask them if they have a wheelchair? And she looks at me and she's like, you want me to ask them if they have a wheelchair? They, I'm sure they do. And for those who don't know, Rachel has like, not terrible social anxiety, but she doesn't like to ask questions. It's a strange question. Like that. Yeah, exactly. that's, a, that's like not a normal question to ask. So she's like, "You want Especially me when, to like, ask she's that?" She's young, fit, and healthy. Right. And there's like they see in the car, there's another young, fit, healthy person. It's right. Like, yeah. She, you want me to ask that? And I'm like, "Yes, like, babe, I, I want walk. you to ask I that. Walk. I cannot walk." Or were my crutches. exact words. Yeah. Or a dolly. She's like, "I cannot ask that." She goes, "It's probably good for you to walk, anyways." Maybe. And so it like triggers in my head. I'm like, all right, great. <laughs> we pull up to the hotel and she's like, do you want me to go and check us in? And I was like, no, no, I'll go check us in. It's, <laughs> it's good for me to walk anyways. <laughs> so this is interesting. So like when you, so there's a thing, like when you are spending a lot of time with someone like hiking, camping, backpacking, paddling, whatever it is, like there's no phones there's no like you're not listening to a podcast you're not like you are with that person and i thought when you guys started dating um it was like a perfect like you guys got to know each other at a race and you get to know somebody when you're running together like we've had great conversations just the two of us just running in the woods and eventually if you do something like a hundred a hundred miler or even a 50k or any race anything that you're really exerting yourself on and the other person's helping you it's like dude just just do what I want you to do. You know what right. I mean? Like you're in pain and you need right. help. And so like, and all they want to do is help you. But then there's like a miscommunication there. So like, did you have a couple of those? Like, yeah, I was basically like, like no, I'll moments. check us in. Right. Like yeah. uh, you stay in the car. <laughs> so I open up the back door of the car and I like try to get out. And this is the first time I had gotten out. I don't Mind know if you, I... you were asking her to get you a wheelchair. Right. 10 minutes prior. Right. So I get out and now my ankle is like, thoroughly swollen mm-hmm. swollen stiff right yeah. not moving mm-hmm. to try to walk was like my one leg was like solid and i was like hobbling <laughs> so i like hobble to the uh up to like the check-in area and there's a sign on the door that says because of covid they're not letting anybody into the lobby so to call this number so i'm just like i walk all the way here yeah 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 me? but then there's like a little window next to that door so i like hobble over there the lady comes over and she's like looking at me like, she goes, do you have a reservation? I said, yeah. And she's like looking at me like, there's no reservations in the system. So I'm like, oh, what the hell is going yeah. on? And at this point, I'm like, man, I got to go to the bathroom. And they might not have ever seen someone with long blonde hair hobbling over, like Probably they got shot not. in the leg. You Probably know what not, I mean? exactly. Yeah. So she's like, who is this guy? What's he up to? Is uh-huh. he going to be like doing And I was like, I just made a reservation online. She's like, yeah. okay, it takes a couple minutes to come through the system. So she like goes back. And I, like, have to go to the bathroom. And she's just sitting at the computer, and I'm like, oh, my God, this could not take any longer. See, that's why you need a van, dude. I know. You could have just gone to the bathroom in the van. I know. So she eventually, like, comes back over, we sign everything. She's like, oh, I gave you – I saw you hobbling, so I gave you a handicap room. <laughs> and I was like, thank you. Yeah. So I get back in the car. Can I get a wheelchair? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. We go over to the room, and, like – I get into the room and like, dude, perfect handicap room, totally needed, right? Like bars for like to go to the bathroom and stuff, like oh, yeah. everything. Yeah. Like the shower had like a seat in it and stuff. Mm-hmm. Like could not have been a better situation. Yeah, and you probably wouldn't have thought to ask for that. Exactly. Because it's also kind of rude to ask for. Exactly. Like you're able bodied. Right. Like, Can I get the handicap room? So, oh, also like eating the whole day after I finished the race, like I was not hungry at all. Oh, that's interesting. And Rachel kept saying like. You need to eat, but like, I just was not hungry. Hmm. We even we tried to go to a place in Texas afterwards, and I ate like a couple of bites, and just like, wasn't feeling it. Yeah, your body's just ready to keep running. Yeah. <laughs> so, we got in the hotel room. She went and got some Subway, brought it back, and I like ate like most of a Subway sandwich, but wasn't was not thrilled about it. Mm-hmm. And then we went to sleep, woke up in the middle of the night, had to wake her up to help me to the bathroom, fell back asleep, woke up the next day, and uh, I think I took, I don't know if I took a shower that next day or the night before, but we just got back in the car, and we still had like 12 hours to drive, and she drove 
all 12 hours back. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty gangster. I mean, shouts out to her. I mean, she should have gotten the wheelchair, but... Um, <laughs> yeah. But, like, the like putting in that amount of time and, like, running back and forth, pacing, crewing... You're, I think you're right. Like, one person is not enough yeah. to do something like that. Yeah. Um, so, what I'm thinking about is... So, wait, what did it feel like to finish that? Did you uh, cry? Like, cried, like, in that last, like, mile of getting back. But once I crossed the line, right, I, like, sat down. In that last mile, realizing, like, I'm going right. to finish this. Yeah. yeah. But then once I finished and sat down, then it didn't that sort of emotion didn't really come in back your out. head do you so like you can you can have that that like that go like i'm going to do this mindset but then also like things can happen that stop you from doing it do you know what i mean so mm -hmm. did, throughout the race did you ever have some experiences like i know that i'm going to finish this race but it's possible that i just blow out my knee and i can no longer walk no yeah you just like you yeah just i knew it. like even if i had to like crawl I was, but even I was in that last it. mile, like having that realization of like that emotional release of like, I did this and I know that I like, I have only a mile left. So like nothing got in the way from my will, you know, right. I had this will, like I'm going to do this thing, but you know, I mean, something could happen. Like that guy fell into you a marathon in, like mm -hmm. he could have broken your, he could have blown your sure. knee. Like he could have hyperextended your knee and sure. then 76 more miles. You just, it's not possible to do that. You know right. what I mean? So, I mean, you could have crawled. I crawled during my 50k. I know. I remember you telling me that. I, I literally crawled during. Uh, my I think 50K. about. I've probably thought about that like a hundred times while running since you told me that. Story. Really? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you just picture me yeah, it just crawling. Yeah, goes through my head all the time. Oh, dude, I was, and it's like a 50k is an impressive number, but it's not really. Do you know what I mean? Like, I agree. <laughs> I thought it was impressive yeah. when I ran it, and now I'm like, it's not really. Like, it. it's if you know people who run like that, it's like 32 miles is like that. You are if you can run 32 miles, you're fit. You're really fit. But it's not like impossible. Like most people, if they dedicated themselves to it, most people could probably do that. At least walk it. I'm at a point I mean? now where it's like if it's a race that you can finish before the sun goes down so you don't have to use a headlamp. Yeah. That's not that impressive. That's not that impressive. Yeah. <laughs> not to you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I was crawling, dude. I was like on I, – I remember because it was a really small race. There was maybe 100, 150 people in it. And, you know, once I finished the marathon – that's when it like mile 18 19 i think that was like the most my, mo my most miles on a training run was probably 20 miles it's like 18 19 20 those were all tough miles and then i slogged my way through to like 25 or 26 and then the last four or five miles i think took me a couple hours mm -hmm. like i'd have to like talk to katie and like look at my journals but in my memory it, like it took hours to do that because like at one point i laid down right and i was like how long could i and my watch died and my phone died and like you've been on the new river trail it's like there's not i mean there's nobody out there right. i didn't see anybody during my race like everybody kind of like ran did their thing and then i was like by myself so i was like well i can just kind of like take a nap it's you know funny that I mean? you bring up the watch dying so on the drive out to texas there's no way your watch lasted the whole 24 hours right? no and i knew it wasn't yeah. going to right so i'm doing like research like before we leave trying to figure out how you get like the most battery life out of this watch mm -hmm. And I'm like, Logan, you're so dumb. Why did you buy this watch in the first place without like really researching how long a battery lasts? Are there, are there watches that will last 24 yeah. Oh, hours? Oh, yeah. Those Sunto watches, like that's what Rachel has. Phenomenal. Really? There's a Garmin 945, 36 hours. Mm -hmm. The Garmin 745, which just came out, like 16 hours with, with all the features turned on. Yeah. So I'm like, what the hell? Yeah. It's like 1 o'clock in the morning. I'm in the back of the car trying to sleep. And it just clicks in my head. I'm like, you didn't even bring your watch charger. <laughs> <laughs> and so I literally said to Rachel, I, I'm like, fuck. And she's like, what? And I was like, I don't even have my watch charger. Yeah. And so now we're like, well, you're totally screwed. She's like, well, maybe you can get one from a store. Yeah, good luck. And right? the pacing on that, like you want that number. Like you want to be able to see... Like you, right. need, you need like the watch is a useful. You at least tool. have to know what your pace is. You have to know what your pace is. Like a watch is like it's crucial. You just have to know like, am I running a eighteen right. minute mile or a twelve minute mile? So Rachel said difference. at that point, she was like, "I will, I will ask people for a watch charger when we get there." There's definitely someone there, right? Yeah. And it's a popular rated right? Garmin watch. Of course, mm -hmm. there's gonna be somebody. Mm -hmm. 
So the first person I asked when we got into the campsite, he didn't have one, but he's like, one of my buddies that's coming, they have they have a watch like that. They you guys are like fumbling from aid station to aid station with like crinkled up grocery bags full of granola bars <laughs> and like no <laughs> chairs. And like, we actually did use reusable grocery bags yeah, for our yeah. drop bags. Yeah, and yeah, you did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then like you're like, hey, does anybody have a charger? While a homeboy is like setting up a propane grill right. and like a changing station right. and like yeah. So this dude that uh, was camping by us did have the watch charger, and he was just pacing, so he didn't even like need to charge his thing. So he gave it to me for the whole night. Like oh, thank God, gosh. it was phenomenal. Yeah, man, like runners, there's something about it because I think it's inherent to the sport. Like, I think there's two things about it. I think doing, doing long distance car, like doing zone two for hours, I think is just good for your heart and your brain and your lungs in a way that allows you to just be calmer Mm -hmm. so that you're not as like, like you're not as triggered. Like you're not as like as, as fired up. Like you're so, and then also the nature of being in the woods for an extended period of time, I think is really nourishing to the mind and allows people to establish relationships. And then the nature of like, we need each other to do this. You know what I mean? Like the, the crewing aspect of doing ultra, it's like a, it's like a NASCAR driver. You know Mm -hmm. what I mean? Like that person might be the one that like waves the flag or whatever. I don't, I don't even watch NASCAR. (laughs) I don't know anything about it, but I know there's a crew and I know there's a driver. Like they may be the ones popping the champagne bottles, but like the crew is what equally allows as important. equally as important, you know? So like people are crewing for crews. They're not on, you know right. what I mean? In the running world. So, yep. And so now, uh, that's what I want to know. So like, where are you at? Cause like we're coming up on an hour and a half. So we might, and like Katie is probably like, Hey, let's, we'll wrap let's, this up let's shortly. but let's, let's like, what else? So what is next? Like, what are you thinking? We don't. Have, we don't have to wrap. We can. We can keep this going as long as you want. I'm just you know, the talking, real but. thing that I was curious about was if you look back at my training, mm-hmm. I was basically doing between like sixty and seventy miles, right, for like the last eight weeks for the race. Is it the? Is it like the amount of time that I was on my feet that day during the race that led to like my knee and my ankle blowing out, or was it the amount of miles? That's a good question. Like if I had ran harder, could I have gotten to 90, 95 before my knee started hurting? Mm -hmm. Right. Or was it? Because you would have been on your feet for 20 hours instead of 23. Right. So then it's like, because my training, right, really only had that like 70 mile max, Mm -hmm. right? And then I made it to like 80 before everything hurt. If I was doing 100, 105 miles a week, would that change it up when it comes to race time that's an interesting question yeah and so that's sort of like what you can play with now right is because like you have that fitness and you can sort of think about those things you can think is it about time on feet i mean i've heard runners talk about how hiking is a useful tool for um like off days just Mm -hmm. because it's still time on feet but it's not as like joint impact intensive and like cardio intensive um yeah, I think the limiting factor would be the legs. Like, that's right. what seems like it was for you. Like, your heart and lungs felt good. I mean, in zone right. two, it's like, it's nothing. Like, you're, right. like that's it, the... In I don't de- think my heart rate got over, like, a 135. But you have race. a... <laughs> but, dude, your heartbeat... I don't know what's going on with your heart. Like, you have a different heart. Like, I, I have looked at our Garmin data, like, side by side on runs we've been on, and my heart rate average would be, like, 165 or whatever, and yours is, like, 135. There's something there's something different about your heart that allows you to. It's larger. It's like uh, you have like remember those Lance Armstrong commercials where he uh, did CPR on the elephant and no. like brought the elephant back to life. <laughs> no, I don't know that one. You don't remember those commercials? No, man, I that's don't know that one. basically what I got going on. Yeah, you have like your, and that's it's just it, the whole thing is a testament to like like dedicated practice of what you did, but also like you you have like athleticism that is not available to everyone. I think you know what I mean. I agree. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> but your heart, your heart rate is just yeah. It's it was super impressive to like look at those numbers. And but the the question of what does it look like to, I mean, a way to put that to the test of like is it miles or minutes? Right. Is to do a hike, do a twenty four hour hike. Right. You know what I mean? And just like have twenty four hours on your legs in that sort of setting. It's true. And you know you'll do forty miles instead, but. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, if you think about, like, Scott Jurek's run, I mean, he was hiking a lot of that. 
You mm-hmm. know what I mean? There's a lot of. I mean, what was Scott Jurek doing on the AT a day? Like 40 miles. He was trying to do, I think, 50, but there were days where he's barely even covering 30. I couldn't imagine that. And see, I think that another interesting piece of like the athleticism that you developed in the running, I think it lends itself to like races are cool. Races are fun and they're interesting and it's an event. But I like the idea of what is an expedition? You know what I mean? Where you see these people like, you know, like, like Alex Honnold pops to my head for some reason because like he did cap and did all this stuff. But like that was that was his race. Do you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. climbing L cap solo and cap was his, that was his race day. Whereas if you follow him online, most of his stuff is expeditions. I'm going to this place to explore the climbing here and kind of see what that's about. And he's able to do that obviously because of financial means, because he's like the most famous climber in the world, but also because he has the fitness and the athleticism to see like, I can go to this place and I can explore and figure out what these rocks are like and what this terrain is like. Um, and I think applying that to running and fitness generally is what is an interesting thing that I can do that uses the things that I built in order to race in order to explore instead. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I think more, a couple more, obviously more hundred mile races, mm-hmm. but I also think, I don't necessarily think I could be super fast in 100 mile races i think you could be fast at the shorter distances i think because of the like speaking of the heart rate stuff i think that you could get i think if you were to train your pace you could do really well at the marathon i think you could do you might be able to qualify for boston if you if you set your mind to that which is a three-hour marathon Mm um i mean what was the marathon time on your 50k do you know i do not know it was probably around four Probably, yeah. Right? And you yeah, were pacing yeah. so that you could get another six miles in. Right. And it was mountainous. Right. I mean, that would be an interesting task. But I think I would do better even at longer you think? than 100-mile races. Wh- who's doing those? <laughs> like, <laughs> and they have a who's that Blackwater those? race. I don't know. Is 135. That. The only race that I know above that is the Moab 240. Right. Because they, they had like a YouTube doc on that. Yeah. Which Moab, I did some running in Moab. It's stunning. It's unlike any other place. I think I can do that one. Moab is insane. It's like, it is, the air is dry, so it's easier to run. Like, you're not heavy on the humidity, but like 102 degrees is intense, but it's not as intense as when it's 102 in Appalachia right. and you're covered by trees, you know? I think of I course, do I haven't done serious miles out there, but you, do you want to do that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. What does that look like over the next three years then? I don't know. We haven't really. It's Bad tough. Water, to... Bad water would be a cool one too. Like doing the hundred mile distance at, because like for for some of these bigger profile races, you sort of need a resume, right? And Go- Goggins talks about that in his book. He talks about how. I don't know what race he wanted to do. It's Bad water. Was it Bad water? Yeah. yeah. So he wanted to do Bad water and. Is that what you meant to say when you said Blackwater? Yes. It's okay. Right, I was right. like, Blackwater? You're I've never right. heard of it. Okay, You're cool. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, Badwater. Is Badwater the one in... Death Valley. In Death Valley. I've been to Death Valley, and it is. it was like 115 or 120 degrees. But the thing about that race, if, if you're listening and you don't know it, Google it. Because it's like it goes from Death Valley to a mountain that's right next to it, which is like 10,000 feet or something mm-hmm. like that. Like the mountain itself is like a legit mountain. But it's ass- it starts below sea level, right? Which is just insane. That would be cool. Yeah, that would be cool. That dude, David Goggins got so many people on that race. Like thinking about oh, yeah. that. Like Rich Roll, who's a guy that I followed. Do you know him? Mm-hmm. Um, he's vegan, by the way. <laughs> I remember when I told you that I was going to do a podcast. You're like, you should have me on your podcast so I can talk trash about vegans. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we could like debate it out. But um, you know, now I'm dating one, and now you're dating one. So like I'm basically like vegan during the week, no, at least not. for dinner. Well, no, you're not. I mean, she cooks everything, so. What's but it? then when I eat lunch, I eat meat. But what's it like? It's not terrible. She basically her famous line. I didn't is expect before this every meal. This way. She says, <laughs> "This may be too vegany for you." Before really? like every meal that we eat, she eats pretty well. Oh yeah, I remember. Well. I remember she was over here, and um, 
I was talking about having had Beyond Burgers or something. Yeah, she's not into that. And she's like, I try not to eat that stuff. Yeah. And I was like, I do. <laughs> She'll have those every once in a while because I like grilling out so much that mm. like she will do that. The but... sausages are good. Have you had those? No, I haven't. I will never and have never Dude, eaten I'm that t- stuff. I'm telling you. Why would I eat that when you could eat a real sausage? Well, we don't have to get into this. Exactly. But like, this might be another podcast for another day. But um, they're good. They're tasty. Mm-hmm. Bad water. Bad water. Maybe the Hurt 100. That's the a hurt- Hawaii. Okay. That one's supposed to have like a ton of roots and like be really technical. Um, Are, do you have any interest in like triathlon? I do, except for the fact that. Because you bike. I don't know how to. Like, I can swim, mm-hmm. but like swimming like that. Yeah, I mean, like, if you do an Ironman, I think it's a two mile swim. Yeah. And there's some sort of like. There's some sort of calculus of what this equals to that with it, when it comes to miles, and it's something crazy. It's like yeah. 50 miles or something. Yeah. But that's a nice thing that Rachel was a college swimmer, so she can, she coach. can teach me how to swim. Yeah. Yeah. You might have the body for a swimmer, too. You're long. So that might you might get into swimming and realize, like, this is... Maybe. Or just or just drill down on this running thing. Moab. 240. That would be insane. By 2024. 2024? All right, it's on the record. This is stamped. This is on the record. I think you should, yeah. We'll tune in on it. Let's wrap this bad boy. All right. How do you feel? Good. Got anything else? No, this is good. We've talked about doing this for a while. We have talked about doing this for a long time. And now that I feel um, like I have the systems dialed in, like everything, it took it took me longer than I would like to admit to figure out how to hook up two microphones. Though, <laughs> Katie and I did a two. Katie and I did a podcast, like my fourth podcast or something. I was like, "Babe, let's do this." I want to learn one. I want to learn how to do the thing, and then uh-huh. also like, when is the last time that you and I sat for an hour and a half without like eating or walking or running? And it's different than running. It's this is a very different thing. Like you're mm-hmm. looking someone in the eye and talking for an hour and a half. It's like we never do that, you know. So I did. I, hooking up the two microphones was, uh, yeah, challenging. It was. It was challenging. A lot of YouTube videos, but you can learn anything on YouTube. That's right. Cool, man. All right, buddy. All right, buddy. All right, guys. I'll do an outro later. That's a wrap. That's a wrap. We did it. <laughs> Hell yeah. Cool. How do you feel? That was awesome. And like, just like they always say in the Rogan ones, where they're like. I can't believe we just did that for three hours or however long they talk for. Yeah. Like that blew by. Yeah. There it is. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Longest podcast on record. First guest on record. We are out here doing it. If you're interested, follow along at AaronWayneYoga.com. Shoot me a follow at AaronWayneYoga on Instagram. Shoot me an email. Hello at AaronWayneYoga. And uh, if you're digging this, hit me with a sub and um, check it out on YouTube. We also recorded this video and put it up on YouTube. So if you want to see Logan and his long, blonde, hippie hair and uh, me sweating in the corner, check it out on YouTube. All right, man. See you guys on the next one.